<clears throat> Welcome to Sunday School this morning. Good to see you here. Thank you so much for joining us for this study as we go into the book of Ephesians. This is our second kind of official lesson, numbered lesson. We did an intro a couple of weeks ago, and then last week took kind of a word study approach to the first three verses. This week we'll move through the middle part of chapter one as Paul sets the stage or lays a foundation here for kind of the first half in a macro sense of our study. We're studying in the book of Ephesians our position and purpose. If we know who we are and we know where we are, I'm talking about in Christ with regard to our relationship with God and spiritual things, where we are in this world, what is your place? If we know that, then we'll have a clear, defined sense of our purpose uh, for being here and what we can accomplish. And Paul takes that up in chapters 4, 5, and 6, some very practical, uh, everyday application, if you will, of what does that mean? So we're studying right now our position in Christ. That leads us into our purpose, and we'll take a look. We're going to take a kind of a look back this morning to take a look forward. If your curiosity is piqued by that, stick with us for the next few minutes, and we'll unpack that from the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 1, if you have your Bible handy, if you have an outline, you can have that handy as well. Let's take some prayer requests as we begin our Sunday school hour this morning, and then we will jump right into this lesson after we sing a good chorus together. I love this chorus, Grace. If you don't already know it, uh, you will learn it quickly. We'll sing it several times throughout this series. It's a common theme through the book of Ephesians, some familiar verses that we've all doubtless memorized in Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves and so on go those verses 8 through 10 of chapter 2 so it's a common theme that Paul carries through we looked at it last week as well grace and peace I mentioned this and I'll repeat it perhaps you're here this morning or you're listening maybe you didn't catch those last few lessons this is an important principle that must be applied in our lives as believers and we can convey this to the world around us you will not have peace whether you're on peace revolves around a certain circumstance or a flashpoint issue in our world or uh, the society or community that you live in. You will never have peace until you first appropriated the grace of God. They always appear in that order. In the New Testament, I believe I mentioned this phrase or some very close version of it appears, I believe, some 17 times uh, in the books of the New Testament, grace and then peace, or grace, mercy, and then peace. We have a world, even we as believers, are sometimes desperately seeking for peace in our own lives, and sometimes we're trying to leapfrog grace in order to achieve peace. God gives us a clear prescription for that, doesn't he? Grace, and then we'll have the peace. Don't we want peace? Anybody just like to fight, please don't raise your hand. But no, that's not true, right? And I don't even think that's true in our world at large. People get very energized about issues and that sort of thing. But I don't believe anybody really intrinsically wants to fight or be at strife all the time. People want peace. We're created that way. We'll talk about that this morning. Okay, enough of the intro to the lesson. Let's take some prayer requests, and then we'll jump into the lesson here in just a moment. Prayer requests this morning, Miss Nancy? Good. Praise the Lord. Okay, good for you. Yeah, good. Get to see John and Jenny and, and all the bunch. Yes, good. Continue to pray for Nathaniel Berge as well. He's still going through his treatments. Um, what a testimony. I think Bob mentioned last week he's got a website, Finding Fanny's Song, I think is the name of his own, or not website, Facebook page. Um, and some tremendous testimony there. So you'll be encouraged by this young man that is definitely suffering, but what a bright testimony for Christ. So pray for him. Other prayer requests? Done? Yes. Okay. Hmm. Okay. 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 Yes. Yes. Do pray for Christopher and Cameron. Brother uh, Harris's grandson as well, and those are serving in our military and our law enforcement as well, Carl and Daniel Byram and Matt Byram and others uh, associated with law enforcement. They have a challenging job, don't they? Continue to pray for the family of Marie Gibbs. Um, if you did not get the announcement last week, at our 2 o'clock service this afternoon, we will have preachers hosting a memorial service here as a church family. Uh, hoping that much of her family will be able to be here as well. So 2 o'clock this afternoon, we'll have our regular opening and then spend that service time as memorial service for her. So pray for her family. Pray for Justin and Harry and all of the, the rest of the family there. Lord, give them peace and direct their hearts right toward him. Karen? <clears throat> Good. 
good. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we share that, Karen, definitely. Yes, Mark? Hmm. Okay. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. All right. Pray for Robin's sister, Angela, as well. Mark will appreciate this. She's having rotator cuff surgery tomorrow and found out Thursday or Friday that she also has a hernia and she's still recovering from back surgery. So pray for her and for Chip and all the ones that she takes care of, grand youngins and all that. Um, obviously, Mark, as you know, she won't be listing any grand youngins for <laughs> a while. So she had the sh shoulder surgery scheduled and then find, found out she has a pretty serious hernia. So pray they can get all that straight and uh, she'll have a good recovery. It's going to be kind of a double dip or double whammy for her here in the short term. So pray for Angela. Now continue to pray for Patsy as well, her family and situation. Pray for other needs in our church, some folks traveling, so pray for them as well. All right, anything else? Yes. Okay, all right, all right, safe travels, yes. Yes. Yes, yes, do pray for, I guess in the news the last week or so have been our Supreme Court justices. Pray the Lord will give them not only protection and safety, physically, but will direct their hearts and minds toward the principles of his word. It's clear, clear teaching in God's word. Um, it's a flashpoint in our society, but, um, but clear, clearly taught in God's word. So you pray the Lord will give them courage. Amen. It's a theme so far that they have declared they're not going to be int intimidated. So praise the Lord for that, right? Yes, bub. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, praise the Lord for that. Good. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. All right. Anything else before we pray? All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his blessing to meet these needs and then to meet with us. Father, we do thank you once again. Most of all, we want to thank you for Jesus. Lord, thank you for sending us the greatest gift of all. Thank you for doing for us what we could never hope to do on our own, and that is to make a way for our sin to be forgiven. Lord, we are at our very best just vile sinners, wicked to our very core. You've declared in your word that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and Lord, we, we humbly admit and say amen to that. It is true in our lives. Lord, so thank you for sending Jesus to die, to shed his precious blood on Calvary's cross, to die and bleed there for us, to endure what we deserved, that we might have salvation. And then, Lord, thank you also that you have invited us, that you have adopted us as your children. You've invited us into your family. You've allowed us to call you Father. Although you are a supreme God, you are the, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. You have allowed, and in fact, you've even encouraged and invited us to approach you as our heavenly Father. And so, Lord, we do so very humbly in a great sense of awe for the communion that we can have with you through Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you can and do answer prayer. So, Lord, as we bring before you these requests this morning, we first of all want to thank you for answered prayer. Thank you for working in Andrew's life and pray that you give them a good visit with Nancy here in a couple of weeks. For Nathaniel Berge as well, Lord, thank you for the progress that he's made. Pray that you continue to work and strengthen him. Thank you for the praise that Bub shared, Lord, that they were able to retrieve this dog and not have any drama or trauma there for Tom and his family. And Lord, thank you that you do care about those things in our lives. We do pray for those that need your touch today, for David Edwards, for others in our families, for Mrs. Gunn's sisters, and for Diane. Lord, I pray that you might work in each heart and life. Lord, use the skill and wisdom of our medical professionals, doctors and specialists, and nurses and caregivers in each discipline. Lord, that they might apply all of the wisdom and grace that you've given them in their training and knowledge to treat and help and comfort these. We do pray especially today for Marie Gibbs' family. Lord, thank you for her testimony, for the many years of faithful service here and at Calvary as well. Lord, I pray that you would bless her legacy and Lord, help it to be an impact in the lives of her family. Lord, pray that you would help them to determine going forward from this point in their lives to be as faithful, to be as committed to Christ, to be faithful in the house of God and the service of God. 
Lord, that her passing might leave a legacy for them to follow. Bless in our services today, Lord, as the preacher opens to us the Word of God, may we receive it with open hearts and minds and uncluttered attention that we might focus our thoughts and our obedience to your commands. Lord, we do pray for our country. Lord, work mightily in the hearts of our officials elected and appointed. Lord, they are, even though they are sometimes in very high office, they are but men. So, Lord, we know that your spirit can, and Lord, we plead with you to hold sway in their lives today. Lord, for those that are without Christ, Lord, may somehow you today convey to their hearts the absolute necessity of this matter of salvation with regard to eternity. May someone have the boldness that comes across their path today on this, the Lord's Day, on Sunday. Lord, may someone come across their path that will boldly share with them the gospel that you died for their sin as well as ours, that you will and can save them. Lord, for those that are believers, we pray that you would encourage and strengthen their hearts today. Help them to stand firmly upon the principles of your word, unswayed by the pressures of society around us, or whether it's via protests or votes or whatever the method is, Lord, help them to stand upon principle that their decisions might not be guided by pragmatism, but that they might be pleasing to you and that your name might be honored. We do ask you, Lord, now to bless in this Sunday school hour. Bless, Lord, as we open your word here to this book of Ephesians. Help us, Lord, to be renewed in our appreciation and our, our deep thankfulness, our gratitude for the position that you have placed us in in Christ. And then may it renew, invigorate us, Lord, to live out our purpose in Christ as well. Give us your grace today and wisdom. Speak to hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you'll take one of those Wilds songbooks, please. Turn to number 83. We sang this, I think, last week as well, but great little chorus. I love the, the meditative, the personally meditative uh, tone of this little chorus. Lord, as I seek your guidance for the day. I hope you've already done that today. Let's sing this little chorus through twice. Number 83 in your Wilds book, Grace, simply titled Grace. What a powerful theme. Number 83, let's sing together. Perhaps you need God's grace today in some way in your life. Make this your prayer, amen? Lord, as I seek your guidance for the day, I find my thoughts unyielding, confusion crowds my way. But then when I bow to you, the challenges you guide me through, your promises are ever new. I claim them for today. Your will cannot lead me where your grace will not keep me. Your hand will protect me. I rest in your care. Your eyes will watch over me. Your love will forgive me. And when I am faltering, I still will find you there. Let's sing it one more time. Isn't there a great message in this song? You ever have those days where the challenges that you find in front of you seem insurmountable? Don't we need His grace? Aren't you glad that His, I like this chorus, His grace will not lead us where His, or His will will not lead us where His grace will not keep us. Aren't you glad for the keeping power of God's grace, no matter what our circumstances? So whatever your challenge is today, or maybe today's a great day, just wait till tomorrow, right? Could be challenges. You wake up in the morning and it's like, how can anything else be in front of me? But God's grace will see us through, amen? Let's sing this little chorus again. I hope it'll be an encouragement to your heart. Make it your prayer, right? Lord, keep me in your grace. Let's sing together. <clears throat> Lord, as I seek your guidance for the day, I find my thoughts unyielding, confusion crowds my way. But then when I bow to you, the challenges you guide me through, your promises are ever new. I claim them for today. 
Your will cannot lead me where your grace will not keep me. Your hand will protect me. I rest in your care. Your eyes will watch over me. Your love will forgive me. And when I am faltering, I still will find you there. Perhaps you've already found him there today with grace that meets your need. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, please. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to pick up our reading of verse 3 where we left off last week. Then we're going to go forward here. Let's read, please, our kind of our text for today, verse 3 down through verse 14. If you'll follow along in your Bible, I will read that text, and that will set the tone for our study today. I've kind of subtitled the lesson today, Original Best, Original Best. I'll explain to you, Lord willing, with His help, what that means as we study this passage of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 1, please, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Don't miss that phrase. That phrase or some version of it appears several times here just in chapter 1, verse 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself. You see this recurring theme, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Here it is again, right? That we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. We'll suspend our reading there, although this, this long sentence, as you probably noticed, actually beginning back in verse 1, this is one long continuous sentence. Uh, lots of phrases that continue the thought, um, but it is really one connected sentence. So, hence, we will attempt to study it here together as much as possible. So, we're looking again, in a macro sense, at our position and our purpose in Christ. They are inextricably woven together, and yet Paul divides it somewhat for our logical progression into these first three chapters that help us us define or perhaps redefine who we are, where we are, and I use this reverently, but with regard to us as believers, what we are in Christ. As we define that, it will help us realize or perhaps renew our understanding of our purpose. What does that look like in what I do? If you are a soldier in the army, you are a soldier. Soldiers perform something. There are no spectators in the army. Neither are there spectators in the army of the Lord. With regard to most employers, if you are an employee of your company, you somewhat define who you are with regard to your relationship with that company as an employee, a manager, a, a worker bee, whatever you call it, president, vice president, executive director, CEO, whatever. But with rare exception, that means, that role means that you perform some function or you should, right? Right? Perhaps in some companies there are those that are on perpetual coffee break, but most of us, Joshua, work, right? They kind of expect that of us. And every couple of weeks they give you this thing called a paycheck. It's kind of a nice exchange, isn't it, Mark? We do a little something, they give us a little something. <laughs> it's the way it works, right? So in life we define who we are, defines our role. The same in the family, and we could go on and on, right, with many relationships 
But most importantly, with regard to eternity, all of those things will pass. Your job will end one day, or you will end at your job and they'll replace you, <laughs> right? All of those things will come to an end, but this relationship will not. That's the importance of this the focus that it should be in our life. So who am I? What is my position in Christ? Well, in a certain way here, Paul takes time in the opening verses of Ephesians chapter 1 to go back to the beginning. In fact, back beyond the beginning. So first of all, consider this with me, number one, and I'll give this to you a couple times so you can fill in the blanks if you're filling in your outline. Projecting previous purpose. Projecting previous purpose purpose. Bob Archer and I were talking before Sunday school this morning. He's on my email list, so he gets not only this with the outline and the blanks, but he gets the answers. So if you ever don't have the answers, you don't get 100 on your outline, see Bob Archer. He already has the answers. No, and several other folks, but uh, I send that out in case folks aren't able to be here. Don't want you to be guessing at the study. So projecting previous purpose. Look at me again, please, in verses 3 through 6 in our text, and then I want to segue back into the book of Genesis. Verse 3 again says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That directs our thoughts, and we looked at this verse briefly last week, those three words, bless, different iterations of the same Greek word. This projects our thoughts into that which we will receive one day in heavenly heavenly places. We're looking forward to that, aren't we? Aren't you glad this life is not forever? I love my life. I enjoy the relationships and the places and the things that, that I'm around every day, but I'm glad this is not it. There is something better, something beyond. Aren't you glad for that? Praise the Lord this morning. There is a heavenly place. But then he makes this segue. In heavenly places in Christ, verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. What a monumental quantum leap from this forward looking in heavenly places in Christ you before the foundation of the world. What exactly has he chosen? And this verse and the following one have been misused, I believe, many times with regard to the doctrine of predestination. Sometimes it is uh, categorized in the doctrinal system referred to as Calvinism, that in which God chooses, the extreme version of it is that God chooses some to salvation and some to damnation. That's just not in the Word of God. Otherwise, he wouldn't say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no asterisk in my Bible beside the word whosoever. And I'm a very simple person, but I believe whosoever means whosoever, right? I'm very simple, but it's a clear definition. So I won't get into Calvinism versus uh, free choice this morning, but <clears throat> there's an extreme on the other end as well. But, but what exactly did he choose before the foundation of the world? Look at the rest of verse 4 and verse 5. According as he hath chosen us to him before the foundation of the world, for what? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. In other words, his original intent before the foundation of the world was this future state of all blessings in heavenly places in Christ in a place that's perfect and holy and without sin. He helps us define this a little bit further in verse 5. Having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Here's the ultimate purpose of mankind, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. As you go back to the book of Genesis, consider this with me, and we'll approach two things here as we look at this projecting previous purpose, that God's original intent before the beginning, if you will, if we define the beginning as Genesis chapter 1 for the book begins with this phrase, in the beginning, right? If we even define this predestination to this state or status as being before that beginning, it happens in, in two main principled ways or two principled definitions, and we'll unpack those here a little bit. But here's the overarching theme, that God's redemptive plan, His eternally redemptive plan, redemption, salvation, that we call it God's plan of salvation, transcends time. I believe it's clear from Scripture that God already determined redemption before He created time, as we have defined in the book of Genesis. The reason for that, the reason for our salvation, is because it magnifies God. Here is the both humbling and enabling principle about your salvation. If you are here this morning or you're listening and you know Christ as your Savior, here is both the humbling as well as eternally energizing principle of salvation. God did not save you ultimately for your benefit. God saved you for His glory. I'm glad He rescued me from hell, aren't you? 
It is an eternal benefit to me that he sent Jesus to die in my place, to shed his blood, and that I can simply say, yes, God, I'm a sinner. I deserve hell and all the punishment that comes with it, but I believe with all my heart that Jesus died for me, and I accept his death in my place. Please come into my heart and life and be my Savior. I can simply do that, and my eternal problem is solved. That still blows my mind. I've been saved for over 45 years, and I still am in wonder that it is that simple for me and was that costly for Christ. Praise the Lord that he saved me. And you can say the same thing, right? I am glad. It is the greatest of all benefits that he saved me from hell and gave me a home in heaven. But beyond that, overarching, in addition, beyond the scope of that, God ultimately saved me because it's the ultimate, the uber demonstration of his magnificence, his glory. All that God is, all that God does are ultimately showcased, if you will, in him saving you. Here's how we find it in Genesis chapter 1. I need to go there. You're all there waiting on me, right? Genesis chapter 1, very first chapter in the Bible. What a great uh, passage here as we study through creation. And we segue here in verse 24 into the the end of the pre-preparation, right? In the beginning, God, verse 1. Then we get down to verse 24. This is the end of the fifth day, beginning of the sixth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. This was an important segue in creation. If you could have been there, you weren't, by the way. But if you could have been there and observed, everything else, though it is alive, is not a living creature yet. The birds and the fish, yes, and created a couple days before, but there's this this kind of awe-inspiring transition on day six to these living creatures that are a lot more like us. In fact, many visions in Daniel and Ezekiel, these creatures are defined by the things that were created on this day, the face of a lion, the uh, uh, bear, the different animals, those were created. So there's a, you would, if you would have been standing there, you kind of would have caught your breath that these creatures suddenly would have appeared. Something different is going on here. And it would have created a certain sense of anticipation. And I want you to catch that as we move into day six. There's a certain, if you can feel in your heart, pretend like you don't know the next two verses, right? <laughs> pretend like you're just an, a, a silent observer. And you see suddenly in the face of this beautiful creation, these creatures begin to appear whatever your favorite animal is, right? You see them, they begin to move about. These are a little different than what I've seen up to this point in the first five days. God said, let the earth bring forth living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Pause there for just a moment. We're going to find in verse 7 that very important two-letter word at the beginning, so. Just like God said, it happened. That's what that word so means. What a powerful word. Don't skip over that word. But this verse tells us that we've just seen all these living creatures come to life, and they are, they are after their kind. They they're mimic each other in their characteristics. And then God uses that as sort of a backdrop for this, this focal point of his his eternal painting, if you will. And he says, let's make man after our image. Do you understand the illustration given here in these two connecting verses? We've just seen all these creatures, and God is very clear in verses 24 and 25 that he created all these creatures after their kind. They reflect each other in a certain way. And if you would have been there, you would have seen this reflection. And then God says, let's make man to reflect us, the God of the universe. So we have this kind of word picture defined in all these other creatures. And then God says, here's the pinnacle. Here's the focal point of the painting, if you will. Here's what I want all the the attention of all the universe and the attention of eternity to be focused on this. So let's make man in our image. And then the power of verse 25. So God created man in his own image image. You've perhaps memorized that verse. I have as well. And we've read it 
countless times, right? But can you absorb for just a moment as we pause there just after that first phrase, can you absorb the eternal import of that declaration? God just said in verse 26, let us make man so God created man in his own image. That's powerful, isn't it? What a privilege we carry as human beings. None of us are perfect in any way. Physically, if something doesn't hurt this morning, just wait. It will tomorrow morning, right? Or tonight before you go to bed, (laughs) right? And if you're not old enough for things to hurt, just wait, Joshua, right? No secret that these physical bodies are imperfect, right? Mark's the bionic man now. He can lift tall buildings because he's got a brand new, well, not quite, but his shoulders repaired. Praise the Lord for that, right? Works better than it did before. So thank God for that. But these bodies are, are, are broken, aren't they? And as we reflect upon the image of God, not only our bodies, but our souls are broken as well. As human beings, even as believers, that part of us that feels and reacts, if we want to define our soul, that emotional center of us, they're broken too, right? I won't ask for a raise of hands, but have you ever responded? I won't even use the word reaction. Well, yes, I will. Have you ever responded or reacted to something in the wrong way? Have you ever gotten angry at something that you shouldn't have gotten angry at? Have you ever taken pity on a situation or a person that you shouldn't have taken pity on? I won't ask this question out loud without looking at anybody, but have you ever let a grandchild get away with something? Right? Present company excluded. Right? (laughs) Don't look at me, Robin. Yeah. And that's a funny example. It's true, though, isn't it, right? Our souls are broken, aren't they? Fear? You ever been afraid of something that you should have said, what time I am afraid, I will trust in Him. Right? Have you ever been afraid, perhaps in the night, and you should have said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You ever been fearful of something that you didn't think was going to be supplied, some need that wasn't going to be supplied? Emotionally, our souls are broken. And in our natural state, our spirits are broken as well. In fact, we'll, find, we'll get to it in Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says, and you hath he quickened who were what? Dead in your trespasses and sins. Our spirits are ultimately eternally broken without Christ. We are dead. That's the worst problem that anyone could ever have, is to be dead. So we are, though created in the image of Christ, we're broken because of sin. Now in this state, here God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, and by the way, my Bible still says, your should as well, male and female created he them, right? Them is a pronoun that comes at the end that includes both those distinct people groups. And I'll leave that one alone, but it's kind of clear in Scripture, isn't it? And then notice God's focus. Again, this is our original purpose, this projecting our previous purpose. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon earth. In this dominion, and he's mentioned this twice, he mentioned it in the pre-created verse, and then here as well as he blesses this new creation, this man that he's created in his own image, he gives him dominion in a way that reflects the dominion of God. Here is the fundamental issue behind every single societal issue in our world today. Does God have dominion? If the answer is yes, there's no conflict, there's no problem. No one needs to protest anything if every person says God is in control. He is a supreme ruler. He has dominion. He reflected us as human beings to have dominion over his other created creation in a way that reflects his dominion over us. Do you see the parallel there? That's the root of every single societal issue is the authority of God, the dominion of God over his created man in his image. That's the ultimate conflict. All those who are fighting against anything today with regard to the conflict between good and evil are ultimately fighting against the authority of God in their lives. That's the ultimate issue. People that shoot each other and kill each other have no respect for life because they are not under the dominion of the giver of life. 
If you understand and you accept the fact that God is the one that gave me this life and he's the only one that can take it away, then you don't take a gun or a knife or bomb or anything else and take anybody else's life because you were under his control and he is it. That's the ultimate issue with regard to homicide, right? It's not guns or knives or car bombs or machetes or anything else. Those are just tools. And by the way, and I'm not going to get into political things this morning, but you could go ad infinitum trying to take away people's resources and they will still find a way to do that which is evil as long as they're in conflict with the authority of God, right? People will kill each other with their bare hands if you take everything else away because their nature is bent to that because they're not under the authority of God. Here's the only thing. God blessed them and said, you have dominion. Here's how you reflect my image. You have dominion over my creation as you submit to my authority. It's this stepwise. And Paul's going to define that with regard to family roles and those kinds of things in chapter five and six when we get there. But we have to understand our position again to understand our purpose and our function. Verse 29, I got to hurry here to get through this passage. Verse 29, God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of, a, of, the, of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, and to you it shall be for meat. To every beast of the earth, to every fowl of the air, to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Verse 31, and God saw every, you could almost insert for understanding the word single thing that he had made. Notice it's two words in your Bible. It is, helps us define not only is it a summary of everything in totality, but it is every individual, every single thing. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, in other words, look, give me your attention. God says, look, here, focus on this, what I've done. Behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the first day. By the way, that's the way God defines days. The evening and the morning, that carries through to Calvary as well. The evening and the morning were the first day. Why? Because that's the way all, all of us, you and I, that's the, the transition of our lives. We are created in sin, we are in darkness, and we come to light when we accept Christ. John said this in 1 John, right? That you've transitioned from darkness to light. That's God's pattern has been since the big first day of creation, the evening and the morning. What a clear definition for us. That's what happens to us. We go from the darkness of sin to the light of his grace. Praise God for that. Defined from the very beginning. No coincidence, the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. Here it is in a nutshell. God created us our original purpose, our previous purpose that will be projected once again in those heavenly places in Christ that he describes for us in chapter 1, verse 3 of Ephesians. One day when we get there, we will ultimately just be back to the beginning. God created man originally here in Genesis chapter 1, we find it further defined in chapter 2, ultimately to reflect himself and to bring glory to him. And then number two, try to absorb this principle of Scripture, and it carries here from Genesis chapter 1 all the way through Revelation chapter 22. Here is the, the underlying reason for the Scripture. Here is the underlying reason for the defined plan of salvation. Here is the underlying reason for God's, the fact that God deigns to interact with mankind at all. He determined ahead of time, before the foundation of the world, we read in Ephesians 1, 4, he determined ahead of time to save man from his sin in order that it might be the greatest eternal demonstration of his godness. Defined in our salvation. That I, as hopelessly lost, alienated, antagonistic, vile, wicked, on goes the description, that God could single-handedly rescue me and restore me. Here's an important principle of discipleship that I think sometimes is missed. I've met believers over years that struggle with their, the security of their salvation as well as struggle with living for Christ. Your salvation was not just to rescue you. I'm glad he rescued me. And I won't go through that again, but praise God he rescued me from hell. But salvation is more than rescue. It is restoration to my original purpose. God saved me ultimately for himself. God saved me for his glory. God saved me that I might be a trophy to the fact that he is God. And his glory, all that he is, all that he does, is ultimately demonstrated in the fact that he can take you, me, and not only get me out of hell, but he can once again make me a reflection of him. That's what he intended in the beginning. Let us make man in 
our image. So God created man in his own image. Paul reminds us here in Ephesians, and this is a foundationally important principle. The foundation of our position in Christ is that we are the trophies of who he is. The whole reason for him interacting with us is to restore us to our original purpose, and that is to reflect God. What a tremendous responsibility. What a tremendous privilege. Nothing else in creation has that privilege. There are some beautiful things in creation, aren't there? We love where we live, and part of that is we get to observe lots of God's creation, right? Creatures and plants and flowers. There's a whippoorwill. He was singing the other night so loud. I I thought he was in the house. It was so loud. Beautiful flowers bloom this time of year. Miss Nancy likes her flowers. Beautiful creation, but nothing holds a candle to you and me. God said, that's the focus. And he knew ahead of time that if he created us, he already knew Adam's sin. He already knew the cost that it would come from Calvary. And he said, this is what I want all eternity to be focused on. He says several times here in Ephesians chapter 1 that this redemptive plan, this eternally redemptive predestinated plan for this holiness, this blamelessness, this perfection in Christ, this was the original state. Here's what he chose us to before the foundation of the world. That's why he sent Jesus, determined to send Jesus ahead of time. This is ultimately so that it brings glory to him, so that all of eternity, all of the universe, heaven as well as earth, all of the angels in heaven will be in awe of you and me. When they see you stand before God's throne and me stand before God's throne clothed in the righteousness of Christ, they will rightly for all eternity say, and I mean this reverently, they will say, wow, look at what God did. God can put him in heaven, perfect, holy, blameless. God, could, God took her they are observers of our world, right? The angels have come into our world, make announcements, and they, they observe, look over the portals of heaven if you want to view it that way. So maybe they've seen some of the stuff you've done. And for all eternity, they'll see you praising him before his throne, the lamb on the throne, and they will say to God, wow, that's something. I mean that reverently. I don't mean any irreverence in that whatsoever. But all of heaven, all of the universe will say, wow, that you and I are there because of what God did. They know we couldn't do it. They live in a perfect place. And yet they will be in awe of what God has done. So projecting our previous purpose, who are we in Christ? We are the focus of God's attention, not only in time, but in all of eternity. He determined ahead of time that this is what he wanted. That's why he saved us, ultimately for his glory, rescue and restoration. We could spend a lot of time there, but I think you get the point. Moving on our text into these middle verses, and we'll read briefly through them again to touch on a couple points. But number one was projecting previous purpose. Number two, present purpose and pleasure. Present purpose and pleasure. So we segue from this eternal purpose of God. Yes, God saved me because ultimately in heaven, he wants me to reflect his original purpose on that, of me, and that was to reflect his glory. I should be a reflection, the image of God in heaven. But what about now? Even through this life that I'm living now, I am to be accomplishing that goal. Yes, I'm still in a fallen state. We still have an old nature, right? Anybody do away with their old nature this week? I don't think so. If you raise your hand, we need to talk because it didn't happen, right? But right now, it's not just that forward-looking, a backward forward-looking, right? This is where God created me for in the first place. This is where I'm headed. This is why he saved me. But the in-between here in verses 7 through 12, we see this phrase, and I won't read all these verses again for sake of time, but we see this phrase come up again and again, according, end of verse 7, according to the riches of his grace. End of verse 9, which he hath purposed in himself. Verse 10, gather all things in Christ, which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him. Verse 11, the end of the verse, worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Uh, Verse 14, the end of the verse, unto the praise of his glory. We have this realization in our position in Christ that we exist even today in our redeemed and yet fallen nature, human nature, still abiding state, that we have the privilege of being to the praise of his glory, of living, reflecting the glory of God today. We can't do it in our own strength. He reminds us, in fact, we'll get to this in the next point about this Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad for the Holy Spirit? I don't know about you, but I would be in a world of hurt every single day if I didn't have the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, wouldn't you? 
not just with regard to conviction of sin, but with regard to guidance. I don't know how I would make decisions if I didn't have confidence that the Holy Spirit of God was living with me and I could ask him at any moment, Lord, what do I do? I have that, I don't know about you, but multiple times every day I'm faced with situations where I have to simply breathe a sentence prayer, sometimes silently, Lord, I need some help here. Lord, I need direction. Lord, what do I do? Lord, what do I say? Nobody else has that problem, right? But anybody else have the need for the Holy Spirit to control your tongue? I won't look, right? Sure, it happens every day, doesn't it? So we have this present purpose that is to be to his pleasure. Verse 9, he's made known unto us a certain mystery. And Paul's going to begin to unpack this in the rest of chapter 1 and then going into chapters 2 and 3. He's going to begin to define for the Ephesians this, what was to them a relatively new concept of this thing called the church. You're not just an isolated believer. You are not just individually tasked with or privileged with reflecting the glory of God, this ultimate purpose as well as this everyday purpose, if you will. But you are part of something called the body of Christ. You are part of something called the bride of Christ. That is his focus, his love. No man loves anyone on the planet more than his wife. She is his daily focus. He does or should do the things that he does every day for his wife. Christ, we are the bride of Christ. He is our bridegroom. What a tremendous privilege that is. Again, consider your position. You are a part of the bride of Christ. And Paul says this, this organism, not just an organization, but this organism called the church is essential for accomplishing, fulfilling that purpose in Christ. We don't have to do it alone. Aren't you glad for that? We have the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. We have the, the family of God to support and help and encourage us as we accomplish this monumental purpose, which is to the beat to the praise of his glory. He kind of concludes the thought in verse 7 with this, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. He's given us what we need, not necessarily as isolated individuals, but corporately. He's given us the structure, the body of the church. He defines this for us in verse 10. He's gathered together and won all things in Christ. Notice this phrase, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Wow, that's a kind of a, a, a large span, isn't it? He's gathered together in Christ the things that are in heaven and the things that are in earth. What a, a massive organism this is, in whom we have obtained an inheritance after the counsel of his own will, verse 11, verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory. And who is he talking to who first trusted in Christ? How do we get to this organism? How do we become part of this organism? It's because of the gospel in the very next verse. You believed in the gospel of Christ. Look with me back in the book of Colossians, just a couple pages over in your Bible. You're probably already aware that Colossians is a parallel um, epistle. So the book of Ephesians, there are many passages that are, are very close, but they are two distinct books written for slightly different focus uh, for to each of those groups in Colossae and Ephesus, respectively, but, um, but nonetheless, some parallel passages. And so he helps define the same thought in chapter one of Colossians. So he's kind of carrying the same overarching theme from Colossians and Col in, in Ephesians in Colossians chapter one. And so he kind of picks up this theme, and I think there's a good definition here in Colossians one. Look at verse 19, please. We'll pick up the reading there. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father, he's speaking of Jesus, that in him, in Jesus, should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, and here it is again, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, so the focus is Christ. What has he done with this salvation? This is the restoration part of salvation. In addition to rescuing me, what is, how does he restore me to my purpose here? Verse 21, and you that were sometime alienated, enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Wow, what a transition. Verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you, this sounds like verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 1, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if he continue in the faith grounded and settled. Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereby Paul made a minister. Verse 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake. Here it is, which is the church. 
Wow. Now, this was a relatively new concept for the Ephesians and the Colossians. This idea, this, this uh, uh, organism of the church, the ecclesia, the called out assembly, this was a new concept for them. They had perhaps in their relationship with the Jewish religion and Judaism knew the, the Jewish uh, believers or the Jewish family of God and Gentiles, but this church organism is new. And Paul says, this is the body of Christ. He just defined that God has put all the focus of eternity and salvation through this Jesus Christ, make, having made peace through the blood of his cross. He's made all things right in him. Wow, what a tremendous work he did to make us right with God. And then he says, all this works in his body, which is the church. Verse 25, whereof I, made, whereof I am made a minister, according to this dispensation which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Verse 26, he talks here about this mystery. He's going to help us understand it. Even the mystery, which have been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Here it is. Here's the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Paul says, here's the daily task. Here's why I'm teaching. Here's why I'm traveling. Here's why I'm preaching. Here's why I'm establishing churches. He wrote these letters to churches because he says, here's the ultimate purpose that we might accomplish this demonstrated reconciliation. The church we as individual believers assembled together ultimately our demonstrated reconciliation, a whole functioning body. Whereunto I also labor, verse 29, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Paul says he's working through me. He's working through me to work through you that we might all be assembled. I go back again to this example of the body of Christ. You may be a kneecap in the body of Christ, which is a critically important function. If you've ever fallen and hit your kneecap on a rock, you know how critically important your kneecap is, right? But it cannot accomplish what your thumb can accomplish. Rob and I were talking this week, I forget what the situation was, but we said that's the kind of thing that you don't realize all the things you do with your thumb until you sprain it. Or have you ever broken a finger? You got 10 of them, right? Spares. Five on each hand. Just sprain or break one. You know how hard buttons are? Pick a finger. It doesn't matter. Thumb, you know, whichever finger, right? We're, we become acutely aware of the importance of every body part. The same is true in the body of Christ, right? If I'm a kneecap, great, but I need to know pretty closely who's the shin bone. We work together better that way, right? And behind me, I sure hope there's a meniscus, right? Otherwise, this doesn't happen very well. And on go the illustration, right? But you get the point. Ultimately, when it all works together, it's wonderful. When your body works like it's supposed to, Karen runs ultra marathons, 50 milers. Well, maybe not quite that many, but anyway. There's a guy at work that's a bicyclist. He is June 3rd and 4th going on a 204-mile bike ride race. You have to finish it in 20 hours. Part of me couldn't do that because of my adult ADHD. I couldn't stay with one task for 20 hours. <laughs> I'm just being honest. 204 miles on a bicycle. You have to finish in 20 hours. It's in Kansas from Emporia, Kansas down to someplace in South Kansas. If you have a body that does that, that can accomplish that, I mean, just finish. I'm not talking about winning, right, Karen? Just get across the finish line. That's something. And people say, wow, what an athlete that is. We are the body of Christ, and when we all function together, things in heaven and things in earth, the body of Christ, our local church most specifically focused, but even beyond that, the church at large, when we all function together, it accomplishes amazing things, and ultimately, it reflects the glory of God. Paul says in Colossians here and as well as Ephesians, that's our purpose, to reflect who he is, to reflect his glory, not only all that he is, but all that he does, all that God does in the world. Study God's work in the world. You're part of it. I'm part of it. He chose it that way. So we have not only a projected purpose, but we have a present purpose, and that is his pleasure. It's according to the good pleasure of his will. It is according to the riches of his glory. Find out what that is. We have a whole book that tells us what God wants his world to look like, and we're part of that. Praise the Lord. 
I want to be the best, I don't know why I'm hung up on this, but I want to be the best kneecap I can be, right? Or ankle bone. You know how many little bones you have in your ankle? Sprain it and you'll find out, right, Megan? Or hit one on the coffee table. That little bone on the outside? Yeah, forget about your little toe until you stub it on the dresser. Then it becomes the biggest part of your body, right? So let's be the best we can be to accomplish what the body is to accomplish in a wonderful, mighty, and eternal way. And then thirdly, so number one, projecting previous purpose. Number two, present purpose and pleasure. And then number three, promised, purchased possession. I know that's a lot of words. I'll say it for you again. Number three is our promised, purchased possession. Verses 13 and 14 of our text. Go back quickly, please. Let's review these verses, and then I'll explain to you what I mean by this. We have an enabler. Aren't you glad for that? This sounds like an awful lot to do, doesn't it, Mr. Campbell? I mean, to do this in ourselves as individuals, as well as to participate in the church in a meaningful way that reflects the glory of an almighty, eternal God, that seems a little bit overwhelming, doesn't it, with regard to the task in front of us. I'm glad we have an enabler. We have a promise that we've been purchased. Verse 13, in whom also you trusted after that you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. God has made in a certain way, and I mean this with all reverence with regard to the Holy Spirit, God has made the ultimate down payment on the ultimate purchase. That's you and I collectively as the church, individually as parts of that church. He's made the the best, most eternally investment down payment that's ever been made. And it's you and me. And he's given us that promise. We don't have to wonder about his purpose. We don't have to wonder about our value in Christ because he's given us the presence of himself in us. It's not just, here's a revolutionary thought with regard to our position in Christ. We are in Christ, in heavenly places in Christ. We will not just be in his presence then, praise God, in heaven in glory. But we have his presence in us now. The same God before whose throne we will bow and cry, worthy is the lamb that was slain, Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 5. Thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and power and dominion. That same God lives in you. The Holy Spirit is a person undiminished in any way with regard to all the attributes of God. So not only will we have the privilege of living in His presence, we have the privilege of His presence living in us. And so as we take a giant step back to this original purpose, we have in us everything we need to accomplish what He set out for us to do in the first place. If you're in the book of Colossians, you read verses 28 and 29. I won't go back there again, but you can review those. But I do want to conclude our hour this morning with Revelation chapter 19. What a beautiful picture here. Here's what we're looking forward to. Here's the presence of God that we have in us now to get us to then. Here's the then defined in Revelation chapter 19. And I know we studied this passage in great depth with Preacher over the last several months, but I want you to just reflect in a way, uh, in a a, a perhaps a a praise-oriented way over the first nine verses. Revelation 19, here's what the Bible says. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Again, they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, that's the church, and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right. 
Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Wow. We have him in us now to accomplish that then. Our position in Christ. Father, thank you so much that you've revealed for us in your word. Not some nebulous searching on our part to figure out who we are or where we're going or why we're here. Lord, you've clearly defined it for us. Thank you, Lord, for this good reminder this morning that we are special to you. You have housed in us the enabling presence of your own self that we might be to the praise of your glory, that we might accomplish your original purpose, that we might reflect your glory, all that you are. And then, Lord, I pray that you'd enable and energize us from today going forward to accomplish all that you want to accomplish in this earth through us chosen in you before the foundation of the world, that we might be before you all that you intended us to be then and all that you will make us to be then in the future. Thank you, God, for who you are, for who you've made us, and for what you've done in us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.